Good morning, friends. Will you stand with us this morning? We're going to lift high the name of Jesus this morning. We're going to sing about our King, the King of all kings. I want to invite you to lift your voices with us as we worship our great King. And we remember the great things that he's done, who he is and what he does. Amen. Let's worship together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. You conquered the grave, you free and free captive, break every chain of God, you have done great things. We kiss your freedom, awaken the light, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great sing together. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Yes, you have. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. God, you do great things.
King of Kings. We give you praise that you're holy. Let's sing this together. A thousand generations falling down in worship. Sing the song of ages to the hill. And all gone before us, all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the hill. Because your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name. Stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. The angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy. If you've been with you, sing the song forever to the Lord. Let's sing it together. If you walk in freedom, if you bear it, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Let's sing the song forever and amen.
Yes, you are holy forever, King of all, King of my heart, holy forever. We worship you, we worship you, we worship you. I've been thinking a lot about the moment we were going to have this morning, spending time with the Lord and just seeking His face about even what songs to sing. And you know, I, I know in my heart, in my life, there's a lot going on. And I think about our world, the world that all around us, in our country, and and around the world. There's a lot of things swirling around. There's a lot of things happening. Even in your hearts, and in your homes, in our families, in our homes, and in our church. And I was reminded of the Holy Spirit with the verse in the Bible in Isaiah that says, He, meaning God, will keep us in perfect peace when our minds and our thoughts and our heart are fixed on Him. So I know the Holy Spirit's here. The living God is here. God is always with you. He's always walking with you, always next to you, always providing, always faithful. But I want us to take a couple more moments and just focus on Him and His presence. What I'm asking of the the Lord today is that He would help us have a fresh awareness of His Spirit. That the fruit of His Spirit would be active and working in our hearts and our minds and in our lives. and He would keep us in perfect peace. We need more of the Lord. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more of Jesus. We need more of our Heavenly Father today. So we're not in a hurry this morning. I just want to invite you to continue to worship with us. Let's fix our attention on Him. Because we need a fresh wind. The fragrance of heaven for your spirit out.
make us more like you, more like you, God. And heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. together with one voice and one song saying, you're all we want. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. 
Let's praise Him today. Let's praise Him together. You worthy Lord. Yeah. And we give you praise today for who you are, for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for drawing us near today. We recommit our, our minds and hearts to be fixed on you, Lord. Continue to lead us in your ways, to walk with us and help us to remain aware of your presence in our lives, be able to hear your voice, be able to live in peace, that perfect peace that goes beyond our understanding. We thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. You may be seated as we continue. Well, good morning, Mountain View. My name is Cliff Fisher, and uh, I do life groups here at Mountain View. Um, and so if you are interested in joining a small group, um, I'm the one that you need to come see. So just so you know that. I got a whole list of things here that they want me to tell you about. First of all, if you are new here, or you haven't given us some of your information and things, there is a Connect card that are on the back of, uh, back of your chairs there. So we would love to have you fill that out, and we would love to be able to contact you so that you can get all the information about what is going on here at Mountain View. Also, if you're new, please stop out by the welcome desk that's there in the lobby. There's a small gift. And they can, again, ask, answer all your questions that you would have about Mountain View and going here. Online, we have the same thing. You have uh, online uh, cards. And, uh, and the other thing that you have online is a prayer request. You all in here can have, uh, there's cards in the seat for prayer. We would love to pray for you. At the end of the service, um, if you want prayer, there'll be a prayer team also in the back. And online, you can also uh, ask your host for a prayer time. Two events that are coming up that I want to tell you about. First of all, there is a Connect event coming up on August 4th. It'll happen after second service uh, up in the great room. This is an event where if you are new or even if you just want to know more about Mountain View, you can come meet Pastor Chris, some of the staff, and they'll kind of lay out for you, here's what we're all about, here's what it is. Come hungry, because there's a lunch that will be served, and this will be after second service on August 4th. And then the other thing we have going on is the church in the park. That happens on the 18th of August. And then, once again, there is a sign-up for that that, that is uh, online. You can either use the Q code that you see up there, or just go to mtnvw.org. There you can find out really all of the events and activities that are happening here at Mountain View. Um, giving, we want to thank you for your giving to this church. Your giving is what keeps the lights on, keeps the doors open, keeps our staff engaged in doing all the different ministries and things that we do, supplies, all of that. So, we thank you for giving to this, to this ministry. Um, you can give online. You can also, there's a box right over there in the door that you can give to. Um, there are several ways to give to the church. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you for doing that. I'm going to pray for our service, and then you're going to hear, because I heard it first, a wonderful talk from Pastor Chris. Lord, we just thank you for this gathering here today, and we thank you, uh, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, and we ask that your Holy Spirit be here with us and be in this room, and Lord, just touch us with the things that you want to hear. Lord, we just ask this in your name, amen.
Good morning, church. How are you guys? Some of you are still waking up. Some of you need some more coffee like I do. Uh, hey, my name is Chris. I am one of the pastors here. If you are newer, if you are a guest to the church, we are excited you're here. If you're joining us online, we are excited that you are engaging with us today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you open them up to Proverbs chapter 18? Whether it be your, your physical Bible, your phone, whatever device you're using, uh, we want to make sure that we are engaging God's Word together. Uh, and while you're turning there, I want to do an exercise. And I want to kind of shape this exercise and, and give some instructions. So here's what I want to do. I want some, some participation. I'm going to say a phrase. I'm going to say part of it. And then I want you to yell out in unison, one voice together. I want you to finish the phrase like as one church. So these are common, these are known, and they're not necessarily true, but they're very well-known phrases. So I'm going to start with an easy one, and we're going, to, we're going to go from there. So first phrase, God helps those who... Oh, good job. All right. Yeah. That, it's not true. It's not biblical. It's one of the phrases that I hate hearing. In fact, one of the times I want to do a series on things that God never says or words, things that aren't in the Bible. Uh, and there's lots of them that is commonly used or commonly said that aren't actually biblical. God helps people who don't help themselves all the time. His grace is just lavishes on, on our world. Uh, second one, if you want to do something, you want to have something done right, you... Yes! You know who says that? Control freaks. <laughs> yeah, like me. Um, like people, like we're, we're not meant to do things ourselves. We're not meant to control things. We're meant to equip others, to pour into other people's lives, to see them, even if they can't do it as well as us, as well as you. Like we are meant to be disciples that make disciples, equipping people. Uh, okay, another third one. This one maybe, might be a little bit harder. It's the least I... Oh, yeah, it's the least I could do. Somebody was like thanking me for something the other day, and I found myself saying that. Like, they were like, oh, thank you for doing this or helping out in this area. I don't remember what it was, but I'm like, oh, it's the least I can do. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, it's not. Like, the least I could do would be nothing. So let's just trash that saying. It's trash because if you've done something, it's not the least I could do. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, thanks for doing nothing, you're like, that's the least I could do. That would make sense. Okay, fourth one. Here's an easy one. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You guys remember saying that in like third grade? Like the bully or somebody comes up to you and says that, and, and it's like that was the big burn back in the day. Oh, I'm going to get you. I'm going to say, hey, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Or your words, your insults, they don't hurt me. Like, for one thing, who's going around with a baseball bat or big boulders breaking people's bones? It's a weird rhyme. Secondly, it's just categorically untrue. Because words hurt. Other people's words have hurt you. How many of you, I mean, don't, don't need to show a share, share of hands. I'll, I'll ask you to do that in a little bit. But I think all of us can share a story or can go back to, to something that someone said, whether it be five years ago, 10 years ago, 20, 50 years ago, that you remember someone saying something that wounded you and left scars in your heart. Whether it be in high school or as a child, with your intimate relationships, or at a job, or someone said something to you that, that tore you down, that discouraged you, that, that hurt you with their words. We could share story after story after story of that. We don't just get wounded from words. We wound others from our words. When we attack back, when we, when we bite back. And so by a show of hands, how many of you, and, and just wait, and I want you to raise your hand and raise them high and just leave them up there. So by a show of hands, how many of you have hurt more people by your words than with sticks and stones? Leave them up. I want you to look around. I want you to see if anybody is not raising their hand. Those people are criminals. Keep an eye on them. 
They might have something that could hurt you. Here's what we know. Our words matter. We are built, we are created in the image of God. So we are created to be relational beings. We have a relational God, so we are relational. Which means that when someone breaks or hurts that relationship with their words, we get wounded. This is why scripture has so much to say about how we use our tongue, the power of our tongue, the power of our words in our life. And Proverbs again and again and again speaks into the power of our words. So look at Proverbs 18, verse 20. I'm going to do 20 and 21 in the ESV, in that translation, the English Standard Version, because I like how it fleshes out. Sometimes I use different translations because there's times when they translate that they interpret through their translation. Uh, And I like that this one is a little bit more literal in it because I want to flesh this out a little bit. So Proverbs 18, verse 20 says, From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Now we talked about the fruit of our mouth. It's talking about our speech, that the words that we choose, that we, when we choose to speak in different ways, when we choose to, to encourage, or we choose to discourage, that we get the fruit of that. So what we choose to say is the fruit of our mouth. This is what I might, I've been practicing this word over and all week, over and over again. For you language geeks like me, this is called the metonymies of cause. It's assuming something positive. It's assuming that here, the words that we use are fruitful, that they're good, that they're bearing good fruit. And then he says his stomach is satisfied. Now, here's where we can get a little off. Interpretations can be different. Some people take this differently. They see this as as like a a literal um, word that like like somebody's stomach that satisfies means that this person is getting payment. They're, They're getting like they're filling their stomach. They're getting food for being a good orator, a good speaker. So someone who speaks for a living, a a teacher or somebody who preaches, anybody who uses their mouth when they do it well, they actually make a good living and their stomach is full. Hebrew here uses this word for stomach as as the Hebrew word baten. It could mean stomach. For a woman, it could mean the womb. It also means our intestines or our guts. And often throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, it's referred to as the the inner being. It's talking about the core of who we are. Strong's lexicon says it this way. They define it as the seat of our mental faculties. It's like when we say, oh, I just had a gut feeling. Or I just, I felt it. I, I knew it. I just felt like in my gut that, that this was wrong or this was right or we should go this direction. It's, it's not talking about your actual intestines like, oh, I had some indigestion. I was a little gassy that day. It's talking about your inner being, your soul, your heart, the core of who you are. So here's what the author is saying. That the fruit of your mouth, how you speak when you encourage, when you bless, when you speak life into people, when you pour out yourself into someone else, it not just benefits them, he's saying it benefits you. That it brings life to your heart, to the core of who you are. It blesses you to be a blessing to others. When you encourage, when you teach, when you instruct, when you are patient, Then look at verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruits. Here in verse 21, he continues this idea of the tongue and and this this fruit and harvest and and talking about how, like the the, the bounty of, of our mouth and how it's used. And here's what he says. It's so important. He says that there's such power in the tongue. There's power in our words that it can breed life or it can breed death. That our words... How we use our tongue can be used to build up people and it can be used to tear down people. It can be used to encourage people and it can be used 
to discourage people. It can be used to share grace and love and mercy and to pour in, or it can be used to tear down and to criticize. It can be used to be a life giver, and our tongue can be used to be a life taker. Second half of verse 21 says, Those who love it will eat its fruit. That it there is our tongue, the, our words. But what he's saying is that we have a choice. That we have a choice to breed life with our words. We have a choice to take life with our words. And we bear the consequences of that. That we bear the consequences of how we use our words. How we use our words in our home, in our church, in our community. This passage brings up so many memories for me of of how people have used their words to take life from me. I mean, I, I can tell you story after story of, of my own life. Of, I mean, I was thinking about this time, uh, this week of um, fourth or fifth grade. I can't remember which one it was, but I had this best friend, and we were sitting out in, in the, the porch. And I remember the day, it was sunny, and, and I remember, like, what we were doing and, and just having a good time. And all of a sudden, so here, here's my friend Dan and I just hanging out, and here's a girl, Heather, that's, that's one of our classmates, the fourth grader with us. And, and she's walking down the road, and here my friend just yells out, Hey, Heather, do you think Chris is good looking? And I'm like, why would you ask that? And she yelled out, and I'll never forget this. She yells out, maybe if he didn't have so many zits. You know, and I didn't like Heather. I wasn't interested in Heather. I didn't want Heather to like me. But those words hurt. And I can remember back to all the people who have poured life into me with their words. Who have encouraged me who have shared the value they see in me, whether it be spiritual gifts or how God is like working through or, or speaking through me. And it's like those things like build me up. They, they, they give life to me. And I can think of the times where not just I've received that, but times where I've done both in my own life. Where I've come into a conversation and I've used words of criticism or, or been negative and, and you can see the countenance of people's faces change. You can see their body posture change. You come in and you tear down or you criticize or you bring a critical spirit. It's all of a sudden their face changes or their body language changes. They just hunch over. It's like you're sucking the life out of them. And I've seen the countenance change when, when I encourage, when I build in, when I speak life. It's almost like the levity in their body brings them up. Their, their shoulders come back. Their, their face lightens up. But it's like, like you see it. You see the life being poured into them through your words. And I've done both. I've taken life with my words. And I've poured life in with my words. We can be wounded and we can wound. We can be encouraged and we can encourage. It's a choice that we have because our words have power. Our words have meaning. We can choose to be life takers or we can choose to be life givers. Which one will you choose? One word of criticism, one, one word of harshness, one, one tear down, one discouragement can be a wound that scars someone and lasts for years. All of a sudden they remember what you say back in the fourth grade. Or one word of encouragement, one piece of kindness. As you pour into them, as you share their value, as you, as you see something in them and you, you speak that out and you, you bring life to them, that can allow them to carry on, that allow them to be built up. You think about this and how we use our words. I mean, if you're married, how, how in your marriage, that in your, even your, your deepest intimate relationships within your home or within your extended family, how you have used your words to tear down intimacy, to tear down unity within your family, or you can use your words to bring unity, to bring yourself together, to build up intimacy. And we get to choose. 
As parents, we can do this with our kids, that we can speak life into them and we can build them up and we can see their countenance change. We can encourage or we can be critical and negative and we can see their countenance change or the, the building bricks of the walls of separation between us and them. Some of us have lost our ability, have damaged our ability to lead and to influence. We so desperately want to lead the people around us, whether it be in our home or in the church or in our community. And we, we have damaged our ability to lead and to influence because our words have been critical and negative and we've torn down people rather than building them up. Some of us have damaged our ability to, to share the gospel and to, to share the hope and the life and the encouragement, the love and the mercy of Jesus because we have been more focused on criticizing what people do and all the things they need to fix instead of focusing on what Jesus has done. Our words have power. Our words give us the ability to speak life into people and we can speak death into our relationships. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Those cutting remarks, those little quips, that sarcasm, that little thing that, that you say that, that's meant to hurt, it's meant to wound. Have you ever had someone, you go to them and you share your story, you share like your struggle and, and whatever it is in your life, and somebody looks at you and says, well, I hate to say I told you so. Or they're like, I'm, <laughs> honestly, I'm not surprised. Or they just say just a little thing. They're like, oh, that, that didn't feel good. That was biting. That's what he's talking about here. Some people make cutting remarks, but he says, but the words of the wise bring healing. That we, with our words, can, can allow our words to be a balm to people's hearts. That we can bring, that it can soothe people. It can bring unity. It brings people together rather than tears down or brings disunity. That it can bring and breathe life into our hearts. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer deflects anger, but a harsh word makes tempers flare. I remember, I, I, I don't know if I've shared this story before, but I was driving down the road, and um, I like to be an aggressive driver. Uh, it scares my wife to death. She's like, you have to follow those people so closely. I'm like, just press the brakes harder. It just, um, but So I'm driving, and we're in Oregon, and there's this guy who's kind of like wanting to race me, and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Like, um, and he's being aggressive. He's tailgating me, and someone tailgates me. I'm like, old Chris wants to come out. And so, like, my wife can sense this is happening, and, and I have the kids in, in their car. And, and again, I, just, I want to, like, do something. I want to say something. And, and he pulls up right next to me. And he rolls down his window. I'm like, oh, it's on. And he looks at He yells at his window. He's like, we got a problem? And I'm like, oh, uh, what can I say? What can I? I'm like, I look in my rearview mirror. I see my kids, and I yell out to him. I'm like, Jesus loves you. What I wanted to say would have escalated. What I wanted, how I wanted to respond, probably could have caused a fight or some road rage. And what I said, he just laughed and waved and went about his day. We have the ability to escalate with our responses. When somebody wounds us, we want to wound them back. When they offend us, we want to make an even greater offense. We can escalate the issue. We can escalate the disunity. We can escalate the argument. You have those people that just want to fight. And when you don't, when you refuse, when you just stay positive, when you, when you are a blessing, it's like, oh, like, they get angry. Like, come on, fight me. No. Harsh words make tempers flare. A gentle answer deflects anger. Responding in gentleness, not just with our words, with our tone, with our body language, soothes, de-escalates. Jesus has a lot to say about our words. Luke records this in Luke chapter 6. He says, but what he shares is what we say reveals our hearts. 
that the words we say reveals what's inside of us. Look at Luke chapter 6. It'll be up on the screens, 43 through 45. It says, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes. And grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Now I want you to see this last part. What you say flows out from what is in your heart. What you say comes from something deeper. Jesus is saying that your words that you use, the fruit of your mouth, the the power of your tongue comes from something deeper. That when we speak life into people, when we share joy, when we speak encouragement, that comes from a place of life. But when we tear down, when we discourage, when we bring criticism and that critical spirit that comes from a place of death, that comes from a place that's showing that there's work that God needs to do, that there's some healing that needs to happen, that we're choosing to speak out of our woundedness rather than the life that God has given us. Scripture describes these words as like having criticism, discouragement, gossip, lying, or idle talk, talking about like speaking nonsense or just having flattery, like these empty words or empty compliments that are not really coming from a place. It is more just fluffery. Or he talks about filthy talk where we, where we use bad language or we engage in the improper joke. He's like, those aren't, those aren't for us. Those aren't for those in Jesus. And he's like, but these, when that comes out of our mouth, is a symptom of something inside of us that needs healing. Here's what I find when I'm struggling with my words, when I'm struggling with the tongue, when I speak critical or, or I'm, I am harsh with my words or I'm short with my temper, I find that there's certain things in my life that I'm dealing with. One, it's when I'm tired. When I'm depleted, whether it be physically from not sleeping or spiritually or emotionally, as I pour out and pour out and pour out and I'm, I'm not allowing myself to be poured into, I'm not exercising, I'm not sleeping well, I find that when I'm tired, when I'm depleted, I, I, when I'm burnt out, like I'm more harsh. I'm more critical. And I find that I do that more with the people that I'm closest to in my home, whether it be my, my wife or my kids, that I'm, I'm a little shorter with them and I'm a little, I'm a little harsher with them because I, I want to keep the mask on that you guys know I'm okay. And then if I'm critical and harsh with you, then, then you won't come. So I save that for home. Man, it's so important that we continue to... like. Practice healthy practices, whether it be being poured into, making sure that we're, we're resting or exercising, that we are physically healthy, that we are emotionally healthy, that we are spiritually healthy, allowing God to continue to pour into our hearts, doing those things that pour into us. Second thing. I find that when I'm harsher, when, when, I, when I use words that, that take life, is that I have some wounds or resentment that I haven't dealt with. That I have some anger, that I have an issue with someone. And when I do that, when I allow that to fester, that I allow myself to be a little more free with my criticisms towards them. Hebrews 12, 15 is one of my life verses. It shaped a lot of, and I'll say this again and again and again. I mean, it, it says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. That the grace that Jesus has shown me, that he has lavished on me, that I'm supposed to pour out, it's my responsibility to share it with others. But there's a second half to that that says, and make sure that no bitterness takes root within you that might damage, uh, cause trouble and damage others. That the bitterness, when we stop showing grace, when we stop lavishing grace on people, I allow bitterness to take root within me that not just hurts me, it hurts those around me, which shows I got some things I need to deal with. I got some conversations I need to have. 
I have some forgiveness that I need to lavish on people. Thirdly, I find that I struggle with my words and the fruit of my mouth when I'm struggling with fear. Whether it be fear of the future, fear of the unknown. There's fear of of things that are new. Fear of things that I don't understand. Fear of differences and what I perceive as threats. I can lash out in anger or I can lash out with my words. I can suck life. I can take life with my words because I'm allowing fear to take over. So how do we respond? How do we become life givers with our words rather than life takers? First thing is that we got to give God control of our tongue. We respond by, by allowing God to have control of our tongue. 1 Peter 3.9 says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people want to insult you or when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. You're like, Chris, that's impossible. It's not impossible. It is supernatural. It is something that takes the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to live this out. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That here's what we can do when somebody cuts you, when when they insult you, when, when they hurt you, when they wound you with their words, is that we can turn and say, you know what, this is not a me issue. I don't need to take offense at what you think of me because it's not me that's really the one that's hurting. It's them. That is not a me issue, it's actually we see because the fruit of what comes out of their mouth is coming from inside of their, their core of their being. And we can process in that moment to say, there's a them issue. And that we can in that moment go, are you okay? Because we can see that there's something that's hurting within them. And then in the midst of that, and they're trying to attack us, we can be a blessing to them. Ephesians 4, 29 says, don't use foul or abusive language, but let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Let everything, let everything, not just when you're, when you're feeling good, let everything, not just when people are being nice, let everything, not just when people are agreeing with you, let everything you say in public, in private, online. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Some of us need to be, make a conscious commitment to memorizing these verses. Because you see that these are challenges for you of retaliating and biting back. Or using words that aren't beneficial. That take life rather than give life. That represent flesh rather than representing Jesus. God wants our words as the church to be holy, to be separate, to be life-giving rather than life-taking. Secondly, as to how to respond, we are to give God control over our tongue. Also, we want to like, pursue understanding rather than just being heard. We want to pursue understanding rather than just being heard. Proverbs 18.2 says, Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. Man, I have played the fool, and I see in our discourse in our country, we have a lot of fools. Because we have people that just want to be heard rather than to understand. We have people that want their opinions to be known rather than hearing and understanding people around them. Church, we have to be different. I read this this week. I love this. It's a true mark of maturity is when someone hurts you and you try to understand their situation instead of trying to hurt them back. Somebody hurts you, you try to understand their heart. You see the deeper cause. And you want to pursue their heart more than you want to attack back. That is supernatural. That is the Holy Spirit working in our lives. 
So the goal of communication, the goal of our discourse is not just to be heard. It's not to vent. It's not to make your opinion known and getting people to your side to make sure they agree with you. The goal of communication and this dialogue should be for mutual understanding. That's engaged through caring for others, asking open-ended questions, diving into people's hearts. Even when they disagree with you, that's in our homes, that's in the church, that's in our jobs, in our community, that's online, that is in our public discourse. And I'll tell you what, I mean, it's been fascinating to me uh, over this last week as we hear cries now publicly for, for bringing down the rhetoric, for, for cooling all of the division and our divisive language that our culture right now is just permeated with. This has been in the church as we reflect culture. Here's what Jesus says, that we need to be different no matter what the world does. We need to be different with our words, that we speak life even when people disagree with us. We speak life even when the world goes in a different direction than we want it to. We speak life even when somebody gets elected that we don't want them to be. We as a church Show Jesus with our mouths, in our homes, in our community, in our world. Lastly, when you mess up, when you tear somebody down, when, when you struggle with your, your words, seek restoration quickly. Repent. Apologize. Go to someone and say, and there's, there's some people that maybe you're, you're thinking about that you're like, you gave a harsh word to or you were angry with and you allowed that to, to lash back or to, to bring disunity or division. And you can go to them this week. You can go to them today and say, hey, I'm sorry. I, I gave a critical word. I, I said something that was harsh to you and that's not who I want to be. That's not what I want to reflect and I want to be different. So will you forgive me? I apologize for that, and, and I want our, our talk, I want our discussions to be different than that. That we repent quickly, we seek restoration quickly. So what Jesus is asking, what Scripture is asking is that, one, we, it says that we have power in our words. That we can be life givers with our words, or we can choose to be life takers. And Jesus, and all the Scripture says, as followers of Jesus, as his disciples, let's be life givers. Let me pray. Father, we, we thank you. We, we know that you are good. Your goodness is lavished on us. Your, your love and mercy and forgiveness and your grace has been poured out to us. God, we're told that to take off uh, the old man, that the new has come, so to put on the new man. But God, there are times that I struggle with that. That out of the fruit of my mouth, I show that, that I am not there yet. So thank you for your grace that you have forgiven all things. You know that we're going to mess up and, and you still love us no matter what. But God, you don't want to leave us there. You want to continue to grow us, grow us and shape us and mold us into the image of Jesus. So may we reflect our newness. May we reflect your love, your mercy, your grace with our mouths. May we show our new life that we are disciples of Jesus by how we speak to our most intimate of relationships. We reflect you in our community. We reflect you in our discourse online and when somebody reviles us for our differences, when they tear us down for our positions and what we believe, God, may we be a blessing instead of responding with criticism or wanting to hurt back. In that, they get to see as we as the church are different in the power that you have with your Holy Spirit that you make in our lives. The church needs to see our difference, God. We know that. This world, our culture, needs to see the difference that Jesus makes. We know that. Our spouses, our kids, our homes need to see the difference that Jesus makes. We know that. May your spirit 
Work in us today through your word so that we can live it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come to the uh, point in our service where we're going to take communion. <clears throat> so first of all, I want to make sure that you all have your, your package here of the elements. I call this that they put this in senior-proof packaging, but that's, that's a story for another day. When I think about communion, um, the word that comes to my mind is remember. And maybe that's because I grew up in old school church back in the middle of Nebraska where that kind of liturgy was just drilled into you week after week after week. Do this in remembrance of me. And what I remember about communion is Jesus' death and his resurrection. I remember his sacrifice and his suffering and the fact that he did all of that just for us. The other thing that I remember, though, is that Jesus often referred to himself as living bread and living water, so that you may hunger and thirst no more. I love that phrase. And that's what communion means to me. That's what I remember. What about you? I'd like you to think about that question. Um, as you prepare to take communion and as you do it. But I also like you to think about one other thing, and that is ask yourself, where would my life be today if I didn't have Jesus? So I'm going to pray for us, and then, um, and then I want you to sit back, meditate some, and think about those two questions. Dear Lord, we are not deserving of the forgiveness and the grace that you show us. And Lord, we remember Jesus' death, his suffering, and his resurrection. And Lord, we remember your grand plan and grand, grand way that you brought Jesus to earth to do just that for all of us. Lord, we thank you for that. And we, Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness. We ask this in your name. Amen. All things have passed away, your love has stayed the same, your constant grace remains the cornerstone.
Solomon, the words of Jesus, say that our words have power, and that Jesus says that it comes from the wellspring of life in your heart, that then it blesses your heart. It's this reciprocal action of coming out of blessing to be a blessing which blesses you. So I want to ask two things. I want you to find someone, turn around, whether they're by themselves, I want you to go seek someone and look at them and say, Jesus loves you and I really like you. Do it. Do it. Find somebody right now. This is Jesus loves you and I really like you. (laughs) 
I see smiles. I see hugs. I saw people first service kissing each other. I think they were married. I hope they weren't strangers. But you see, like, here's the promise of God's word. As you say that, as you speak life into one another, it's blessing us and we see it on our faces. Here's my ask. Here's my encouragement to you. This week, intentionally focus on pouring life and value into the people around you. Do it with those who are close to you. Do it with those who are against you. Do it with those who you really don't like. Pour life into them. Encourage them. Allow them to see Jesus through your mouth. If you need prayer of any kind, we have a team that would love to pray for you. If you're new, if you're a guest, we have a gift at our welcome desk for you. We would love for you to turn in that Connect card and just allow us to get to know you and to share a little bit about our church and welcome you into this church. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. And in our world of division and hatred and disunity, may we bring people together with our words that speak life because we have the life of Jesus in us. God bless you. Have a great week.